Thank you, David. Good morning. Um, Okay, good morning. Um, um, as you can see, David and I are good friends, which explains his generous, his generous and very kind introduction. Um, um, okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, to address, to speak to such a distinguished audience. Um, I've been asked to give a brief presentation on where I think the accountancy profession is heading over the next 10, 20 years. And uh, I'm happy to, to share with you some insights, some views which I draw from the three roles which I bring with me on stage today. As David said, I'm a director at uh, KPMG. I lead the accounting advisory uh, unit. But I worked for seven of the last ten years at the Moore <coughs> Institute of Accountants, uh, leading its technical department. And I also uh, I am also a resident academic at the University of Malta with teaching and research responsibilities. Having said that, the views uh, that we'll, we'll be discussing, I, I'll be going through today are, of course, I need to qualify my views and may not necessarily be those of KPMG, the institute or university. Okay, I thought of um, uh, going through some big picture developments that we've seen rolling out over the recent past and which I think will will change, will change the way we do things, will have an impact on our profession uh, going forward. I mean, we're now coming out of the uh, emerging from the global financial crisis. We've seen audit, the audit profession, independence, auditor independence being put under scrutiny at EU level, but I mean, this, as we will see, will also have other knock-on effects beyond the EU. Uh, boundaries. So we'll discuss, we'll discuss the audit reform that started off in 2010 and how it was voted upon by the European Parliament only last month and we'll also discuss some key ramifications that this reform will have on mandatory firm rotation, non-audit services and also audit reporting. Uh, we'll move on to my bread and butter, then we'll, we'll discuss uh, IFRS standard setting and what's, what's interesting to note in that space, particularly as we come out of eight years of convergence efforts, which should have led, I will explain why, they should have led to a converged set of standards uh, by the first half of this decade. Unfortunately, that will no longer be the case. So we'll also discuss that. Regulation and oversight. This was another aspect which, unfortunately, during the financial crisis, has put, again, the audit profession under the spotlight. And we're seeing at EU level uh, a change in the oversight structure, uh, so we'll also touch base on that. Then I'll move on to this thing, small first mentality, which comes, which is a phenomenon uh, which is increasingly gaining, uh, gaining track, particularly with the increase in the number of SMEs, and we'll also see what's being proposed in that space. Um, and finally, I will, I will wrap up with, uh, with some other aspects of our profession, some, some changes, some other involvements that I see that we will we'll, we'll be getting into as, as we go along. New service offerings, sustainability, uh, alternative assurance, and finally, some, some insight on global trends, although uh, I believe Alan can, can, also add, can also add a lot that for our conversation earlier this morning. I mean, with all these, we have, we have as a profession a two-fold challenge. So first, we need to understand how these factors, and many, many others, but how these factors will affect our clients, will, will, will change the organizations that we serve. And secondly, we also need to understand the implications on our profession, on the standards, and also perhaps on training and development of tomorrow's accountant, which we need to shape today. Starting with audit reform, um, this has been going on for the last <clears throat> four years. Commissioner Barnier, uh, a, former, a former French Minister of Finance, uh, had proposed uh, significant proposals, quite controversial, I must say, some of them, 
in 2010, and they have been voted upon by the European Parliament on the 3rd uh, of April, bringing to an end, so to speak, four years of uncertainty and controversy on, on, on auditor independence, uh, non-audit only, uh, non-assurance services. So uh, we had those proposals being, being on the table for the last four years, uh, most of which have now been voted upon and approved to be issued in a final directive, subject to ratification by the Council of Ministers, which should take place anytime soon by, by the end of next month. Following which, following which member states will have a, the usual two-year two -year time frame to, to, implement, to implement these uh, reforms, this directive, in national legislation. Now, I appreciate that some of us are not coming from EU practices. However, this is not, certainly not, irrelevant to non-EU practices, as we will see. Uh, it has ramifications also on the whole network within which the EU auditor is, uh, forms part. So, so it's, it, it goes beyond, as I was saying, EU, EU borders. Um, I mean, this audit reform was controversial in many respects. However, we've also seen some very welcome welcome changes to the audit profession, in particular the adoption of international standards on auditing. I mean, in Malta we've been adopting international standards on auditing and IFRS since 1995, but now uh, IFRS has been codified in the EU since 2005 and now they've also adopted international standards on auditing. So that's a very welcome, that's a very welcome change. Um, another, positive, another positive aspect is the strengthening of the audit committee and expanded auditor, auditor reporting, the long form audit report, as we will see in a few minutes. <coughs> of course, there are other aspects in the C form which are still quite controversial and which will have a significant impact on the way we do things, on our business models uh, as, as accountancy practices. And I chose, I chose to discuss in particular two of these, so to speak, controversial reforms, being mandatory firm rotation and, and non-audit services, the prohibition of non-audit services. So this directive, this directive requires, requires mandatory firm, not wide, firm rotation every, every 10 years. So that's the general rule. So every 10 years from the date of the first, and uh, for, from the first financial year, covered by an audit engagement letter. Of course, member states can go for a shorter, can go for a shorter period. For example, in Italy, we have nine years. In the Netherlands, we have eight years mandatory firm rotation for public interest entities. Um, so this is, all, this is all within the ambit of public interest entities. So the general rule is 10 years or, or less. Member states, when implementing and transposing this directive in national legislation can also allow a longer period, can also allow a longer period, longer than 10 years, uh, provided, provided that the audit is put up for tender at the end of those 10 years. And if that is the case, the firm can be appointed for a second term of 10 years. So 20 years is the maximum period, is the maximum period uh, over which over which an auditor can act as uh, an audit firm can act as auditor of a public interest entity. Um, in the case of a joint audit, member states can allow can choose to allow joint audits, and in that case, the, fir the mandatory firm rotation would, uh, would would go up to 14 years. We have some transitional transitional measures, as you can see. I mean, this is going to hit us in six, nine or 12 years from, from, from the date on which the directive is implemented. So in that case, if say for example an auditor has, has been appointed for more than 20 years, the auditor, the audit firm, will have to rotate out in six years after the adoption of the directive, which is next in a few months time. Uh, between 11 and 20 years, the auditor, the audit firm has rotated nine years and so on and so forth. So, uh, maximum, maximum uh, of 
12 years maximum of uh, 12 years to rotate if the auditor has been uh, auditing this public interest entity for less than 11 years. So this, this will present audit practices, the profession with challenges and opportunities. I mean challenges in the sense that we will have, will have certainly changes to our public interest audit portfolio. So we will have to rotate out of certain public interest entities over time, but of course there's also opportunities here. There's also opportunities to pitch for other public interest entity audits and also opportunities to retain tax and advisory work on, on, on public interest entities which we rotate out of given our knowledge of the business. So opportunities and also some threats in that space. Um, unfortunately here yeah, it's it's not it's not that uh, much of a bright uh, uh, future. So we will have we will have to cope with these significant restrictions, significant restrictions on non-audit services. And by the way, these restrictions apply not only to the statutory auditor but also to all members of the statutory auditor's network, which are prohibited from providing non-audit services, these non-audit services, to the PIE, to the PI itself, but also to the PI's EU subsidiaries and the PI's EU parents. And as we can see, I mean, we have, we have various restrictions. The, the, the light red coded boxes are all restrictions which uh, no matter what, no matter how material, no matter how, how non-pervasive these, these services are to the audit, we cannot provide these services to our PI audit clients. And I mean here, we're going to tax, into tax services in the next night. So here we can see I mean, internal, internal audit, assistance and internal control, legal services, totally prohibited. Um, Member states can choose to allow certain tax services and certain valuation services, subject, subject to a number of conditions, which we will see very shortly. However, there still is the overriding limitation that any, any revenue from non-audit services cannot exceed more, cannot exceed 70% of audit fees, the average of audit fees over the last Three years. When it comes to tax, we have we have as you can see we're we're, we're restricted from providing tax uh, advice, tax services in relation to payroll tax and uh, customs duty. However, we can we member states are allowed or can choose to allow uh, auditors, statutory auditors, to provide the amber shaded tax services of tax forms, support regarding tax inspections, uh, calculation of, uh, of indirect tax and deferred tax, and that services on those lines, again, subject to certain conditions which we will see shortly. And I mean, what's, what's the challenge here? What's the challenge here is that, I don't know if I can call it perception, but there is certainly the perception that audit is not well, let's say audit is probably the loss-making uh, function of a practice. At least, let's say, let's call it a perception. Whereas the tax and advice, the services are the more are the more lucrative. So, I mean, this prohibition of non-audit services can have can have uh, implications on our practices' profitability, employability, employability and also, I would say, uh, sustainability. So, we need, we need to take a close look at our business models and need to decide, need to decide, probably going forward, where to pitch or where to stay out. I mean, we've seen this last year. We've seen Ernst and Young, for example, not tendering for the HSBC Global Audit last year, probably the reason being to retain their advisory work. So, going forward, we'll also, we'll also have to be now think twice before going in, going in for an audit pitch problem. The conditions. Member states, member states can allow certain tax 
and valuation services, provided that, provided that, I mean, they are immaterial, they don't have a material effect on, on, on the audited financial statements. Uh, we must, the auditor auditor must report the estimate of that effect comprehensively to the audit committee, and of course, the principles of independence have to be complied with. So, I mean, we can see, we will be open to different interpretations and judgment of materiality, and we will also, uh, we could also see different member states going for different options. However, being one market and beyond, uh, it's going to be interesting and challenging to see uh, how to operate in, in this stricter or stricter environment. A welcome, a welcome uh, change from the uh, from this audit directive, at least in my view, is the expanded, the long form audit audit report, and which was also under scrutiny uh, in, the, in these proposals. Uh, the report was criticized for failing to address or to communicate the key risks that have been identified in the audit. We were also criticized uh, on issuing clean audit reports for financial institutions which failed only a few months down the line. So one of the, one of the key proposals is to go for a long-form audit report where the auditor has always for public interest entities, the auditor has also to include a description of the most significant audit risks, how the auditor has addressed those risks, and finally, what is the auditor's uh, conclusion. Um, this, this may sound quite, quite challenging, though not necessarily in the sense. Um, to stimulate debate, to stimulate debate, APMG have issued uh, what is probably one of the first, I would say, long form audit reports uh, last February for Rolls Royce, where I mean it's a six-page, it's a six-page report, and they are going into the merits and giving a description of the most significant assessed risks and a summary and a summary of of the auditor's uh, approach and conclusion. I mean. If we had to take a closer look at, at some key aspects of this report, I mean, we have the usual opinion, okay, so that's the standard opinion, uh, our opinion on the giving a true and fair view and uh, prepare the reporters with IFRS. However, interestingly, so we have a number of areas in this audit report where the auditor, where the auditor is listing the key, uh, the most significant risks that have been identified during the audit. I mean, just to give you an example, this is not meant to be readable. So it's, it's, it's a very small text. However, you can access the Rolls Royce or the report, it's uh, so in public domain. But, for example, here they're saying the risk is the amount of revenue and profit recognized in a year um, on the appropriate assessment of whether or not each long term aftermarket contract is, is linked or separate. The auditor's response, we have made our own independent assessment with reference to the relevant, to the relevant accounting standards. Finally, the auditor's, the auditor's findings, we found that the group has developed a framework for selecting the accounting basis to be used, which is, this is, this is going beyond the standard opinion, which is consistent with accounting standards and has applied this consistently. So, I mean, I suppose the auditor is with us today in this room, will appreciate the extra mile that auditors have to walk to be in a position to report on such matters and uh, such findings, not to mention the risk management vetting and implications that will probably go in the process of issuing an audit report. My hobby, IFRS. Um, we've seen we've seen a very, very, very busy IASB agenda over the last eight years since the Memorandum of Understanding was signed with the U.S. Accounting Standards uh, Board. And uh, when preparing for this presentation, I counted, I limited myself to three years, and I counted what the IASB have issued since May 2011, and I counted. 23 new standards 
interpretations or amendments only in the last three years. So there's practically two changes, standards, interpretations every three months. So this is becoming an increasing, increasingly becoming an area of specialization. Um, and mind you, out of these 22, we had some controversial issues, such as control, the determination of control, classification of joint ventures, fair value measurement. So quite, quite heavy, heavy subjects. Keeping abreast for our clients has been is becoming increasingly challenging. I mean, technology today is making the world turn faster. And whereas perhaps in the past we had an information gap between the issuers of an exposure draft and the final standard, today we have monthly board minutes being published and clients expect us to keep abreast of those changes and advise them accordingly. Okay, I'm seeing five minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, keeping abreast is, is becoming increasingly challenging. Political influence. I mean, the IASB is in, is in selling mode and sometimes we see changes to standards which might not have perhaps a very sound technical or conceptual basis. Unfortunately, that's the reality. Um, in the interest of time, I, I move to convergence. <coughs> I mean, we've been through eight years of joint projects. We've seen a number of standards being issued from time to time. We've been promised a set of global standards. Great for the profession, investing time and resources uh, on one set of global standards. Where can you, where, where can you go better than that? However, <coughs> however, oops, however, we're seeing, I mean, we've just seen, sorry, we've just seen this year, particularly this year, a trend, uh, or rather, the boards agreeing to disagree. The FASB and the IASB, in particular the FASB, has decided not to adopt certain, certain uh, measures in the amendments of standards on very, on very important issues, such as financial instruments, leases, uh, leases, and we're seeing divergent views, we're seeing divergent views, uh, which will leave us, unfortunately, with two sets of standards and requiring us to keep abreast of the complexities and divergencies in both. Regulation and oversight. We will also have to get used to a new oversight structure. Um, we're seeing at EU level the, the formation of a super regulatory body, the Committee of European Audit Oversight Bodies where also ESMA, the securities market regulator, will hold an observer non voting role. But it's going to be interesting to see, to see where this will lead. Supervision of the audit profession. I mean, there are countries like Malta, for example, we've adopted a fully independent oversight uh, system completely under the government of Malta, but there are member states which are still using either professional bodies for their quality assurance reviews or a mix of both. Now, going forward, public interest entity auditors will have to be, will have to be reviewed uh, by and supervised by independent, by independent oversight bodies. This single accounting directive, uh, things more first. I mean, we've seen, we've seen uh, over the last, over the last, two decades, a decline in large corporations and uh, the relative growth of SMEs, 22 million SMEs just in the EU. And this led to increased pressures to take small first. And we've seen, we've seen the, the issuance of the uh, single accounting directive last year, uh, which is proposing significant exemptions for small and medium. So we've discussed Significant restrictions on public interest entities. We're now discussing exemptions for small and medium. Oh, it does not leave us to, to provide our services. Um, I was also involved in research on this subject matter uh, earlier this year. And we, it's interesting, it's interesting the views that were heard by different stakeholders and users of financial 
uh, SME financial statements in the interest of time. I won't go into the merits. However, one thing is clear. We need, we need as a profession to become more relevant in that space. The historical information that we report on is no longer very relevant to bankers, to lenders, to creditors. So we need, we need to evolve and uh, we need to close this expectations gap. New service offerings. Um, I mean, climate change, climate change, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are causing, are causing huge pressures on, on governments, on, on uh, jurisdictions in general. And policies, mitigation policies need to be in place. I mean, resources stress. The pressures of population growth, economic growth, climate change is also putting, is also putting a lot of pressure on governments to, to, to address these issues. Where we come in, we come in, of course, on uh, giving assurance, giving assurance on sustainability reports uh, and also help the thought leadership, help government and the standards that there is and the regulators to put in place sustainable, sustainable uh, measures. Um, again, there are mixed views here on whether, on whether the uh, assurance is a requirement on sustainability reports or not. Mixed views coming from, from research. Um, the key, the secret here lies in changing possibly the way we do things, the way we approach our, our assurance our assurance, our assurance methodologies, and uh, we need to be more analytical as, as resulting from this research that I've been involved in again, more analytical, more flexible, innovative, and uh, I'm particularly, I like what Dr. Steve Pretty, uh, who's the former technical, director of technical policy at ACCA, had to say on this uh, in an article which is quite recent. I mean, he said accountants working alongside engineers and scientists, and perhaps actuaries, must address this market failure as a matter of urgency and the scope of audit must evolve. Alternative assurance, we need to balance, I'm, I'm soon concluding this, but just two minutes ago. Um, alternative assurance, we have pressures on one side, pressures on one side to reduce the cut red tape for small and medium sized practices. On the other hand, at least the more that we've seen government and the revenue authorities being very reluctant, very reluctant to let go of this assurance which is giving them a lot of comfort as we speak. So we have to be careful in the future not to end up as possibly tax auditors. So we need, we need to be proactive in this, we need to reinvent ourselves, we need to, to have a close look at our offerings and go to market with our offerings. Future performance. I'm seeing, I'm seeing this increasingly also with standards, estimates of fair value, estimates of useful lives, estimates of provisions, all forward-looking, and probably that is going to increase going forward. My last slide: uh, shift in regional, in regional powers, shift in regional powers. Um, interestingly enough, according to Commissioner Barnier. Um, the emerging economies, of course, not Commissioner Bonnet, but the emerging economies are lifting millions out of poverty. And this is resulting in a rebalancing of global power. And according to Commissioner Bonnier, by the year 2050, no individual <coughs> EU member state will be part of the G8. So we will see, we will see a change, we will see a change to the way that decisions are being implemented today. We will have new superpowers taking decisions on our behalf uh, in, years, in years to come. Uh, also, the growth, the global population growth and the different mix. <coughs> we, will have, we will have a different culture and a different workforce in our practices going, going forward. And finally, the role and size of the public sector. That needs to be retaught. Public-private partnerships are probably going to increase going forward as the government part, governments part with private governance and private business mentalities 
and of course the profession has a key role to play in that transformation. Finally, I conclude with uh, by reading two small verses from a poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. And he said, two roads diverged in a yellow boat, and sorry, I could not travel boat and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it went on the other boat. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hands. Two roads diverged in a and I would, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And it made all the difference. So ahead of us, we have a lot of paths, not just two paths. Some leading to challenges, others leading to opportunities. The profession needs to be savvy enough to know the difference between the two and to, to change, to adapt, proactively adapt to these changes at very short notice uh, when it makes sense to do so. Thank you. I'm sorry for overrunning a bit. Um, thank you, and I wish you a successful uh, conference. And, uh, and I hope you also enjoyed the staying here with us in Malta over this weekend. Thank you. and feedback from, from previous events where people actually want to go to both or have the option at least to go to both in many respects. 